taught them everything they know. Turn. We've got some friends here tonight. I'm really glad they're with us. Chuck and Dee Carl. They came all the way from Kansas City, Missouri today to hear me preach. <laughs> and they're going to get to spend the night with us and tomorrow. Most of tomorrow anyway, I hope. Now, well, I didn't catch that what you said. I said I got some friends here from Kansas City. Oh. Yeah. All right, but you just, yeah. <laughs> All right, but you just live about a block from here, see. <laughs> All right, you do that. Yeah. You know, I think Clyde, the rougher you get, the better Clyde likes it. I think that's the way he likes it, didn't it? Tonight I want to preach. Tonight I want to, amen. Yeah. Hallelujah and all that, yeah. Tonight I want to preach about the, the fragile gospel. The fragile gospel. And that's strange that it's, it's fragile because of the power that it contains. The gospel is able to save to the uttermost. There's never been a sinner that the gospel couldn't save. There's never been a nationality, a race of people. It, it, it matters not about age or financial status or educational status. Yes. Brother Hoyad, I was going to preach for the next Sunday, and his book, he got two artificial feet, you know. Mm -hmm. See, there's just so many things that we could be preaching and people could go to hell as a result of it. It's not fragile. He said it's a gospel that isn't a gospel. And the word gospel means good news. And it really isn't good news. It might sound like good news, but it isn't good news. But there's only one gospel, and it's pure. But we can't contaminate it. You can't alter it a bit. You can't add to it. You can't take away from it. And you can't exchange one ingredient for the other. It turns out like my fudge if you do. And you all remember the fudge story where I made the fudge and I had, I, I, everybody's shaking their heads, but some, I like to tell it, okay? <laughs> just, just bear with me. Yeah, Pat, listen, Ted has not heard it. Put your fingers in your ears. He's going to hear it. I was going to make some fudge one time, Ted. <laughs> and I put the cocoa in there and the sugar in there and, and eggs and everything goes in fudge. I don't, I don't think eggs go in it, but I put everything <laughs> I put everything in there that needs to go in there, and I cooked it, and I stirred it. I stayed right there with it, you know, till it got to the softball stage. And I had my pecans ready. I already had the plate all buttered. And I took it off the fire, put it over in the sink in some cool water, and I was whipping that. And you're supposed to add butter after you cook it, but you're also supposed to add vanilla extract. Well, I didn't have any vanilla extract. But I had some lemon extract. Extract's extract, right? <laughs> no. But you know, I put, and I didn't use very much in that whole big pan. I used like a teaspoon of, of lemon extract. That's it. Not very much. And when it started to get stiff, I dumped the con cons in it, dumped it out on the plate, spread it out, and that fudge was beautiful. I couldn't hardly wait to cut that fudge. And I cut that fudge, and I'm not kidding you, it was just beautiful. Homemade fudge, and I don't know what you right, know right now, it's not the marshmallow kind either. It was a real old-fashioned fudge. And that was the most horrible stuff I ever put in my mouth. I didn't realize that just a teaspoon of vanilla, of, of lemon extract could ruin a whole batch of fudge. I couldn't even pick the pecans out of it. It ruined <laughs> I think he even threw the plate away. It ruined the whole thing. So if you're wondering where the plate went. That's the way the gospel is. The gospel is pure. And the apostle Paul says in Philippians, he said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. The apostle Paul was a, a man that was so jealous and protective of the pure gospel. In the Galatians, first chapter, if you will notice here, it said, Paul, an apostle. I'll give you all time to find Galatians. That's in the New Testament. Page 1241, if you have a Scofield Bible. What? 
Paul, an apostle. Now, he wants you to know something, folks. It's not of man. Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He said, that's where I got my apostleship. I didn't go to apostle school. I didn't volunteer to be an apostle. My mother didn't pick me as an apostle. In fact, the apostle Paul goes on to say, I gave up a lot to be an apostle. Notice what he says, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. He says, I didn't get my apostleship from man, neither is the message, the good news, the gospel that I preach after man. I didn't, after I was called as, as an apostle, I didn't go to some preacher and ask him what it is that I need to be preaching. Now, I am not, or maybe I am, I don't know. I don't think, I think I'm a little bit open-minded towards seminaries. But I'm afraid that seminaries are the ruination of our churches today. You go to seminaries and you learn everything but Bible in the seminaries today. He says, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversion in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. In other words, he's saying this. Now, I didn't just want to start a new career. He said, I had it made in the Jews' religion. But he said, God called me as an apostle. God himself gave me the message that I preach. He said, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw a nun named James, the Lord's brother. Now, he wants you to know something, folks. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. The Apostle Paul laid his life on the line in defense of the gospel because it is the only way that we can have eternal life. And I cannot sympathize with anyone. You know, I'll tell you something. I'm just going to do this too before I get fired because I'll probably get fired if I do I don't like what's going on. And I don't like this big movement that Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell and the Southern Baptist leaders, are, this petition, they're signing this agreement that they're signing with the Catholics. I don't like it because they've agreed that we will not witness to Catholics. What they're trying to do is bring all the churches under the Pope, if you want to know. And I don't agree with that. We've only got one gospel, and it is written and declared in this book right here. Now, the apostle Paul in Corinthians, the fourth chapter in 2 Corinthians, said this, I am a minister. He said, God called me into the apostleship, and I am a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I have this ministry because of mercy, and we faint not. Now, what do you mean, faint not? Well, look what all he went through to be an apostle. Look what he says here. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And also 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, he tells it a little bit about what he had to go through. He says, I am more in labors 
more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Three times was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I suffered shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And he did all that for the gospel's sake. But do you know what he called all that? A light affliction. Isn't that something? All that the Apostle Paul went through, he said it's just a light affliction. Well, how could he look at it like that? Because I know my wife can give me a dirty look and I feel severely persecuted. <laughs> Wayne can stub his toe and I mean, you'd think, you know, the Armag Battle of Armageddon set in or something. <laughs> think it was in the tribulation period. And if you're around him, you'll think you're in the tribulation period when he goes through that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he knows I love him. But why do we look at trials the way we do? I'll tell you the problem with the church. And I'll tell you the problem with us as individuals. All we see is the here and now. All we see is what's happening to me right here, right now, today. Do you know most people get saved? I won't say most people, but a lot of people get saved thinking this. If I get saved, that means God gives me more toys. And if I fall down, skin my knee, he'll kiss it and make the pain go away. You know what I'm saying? Most people think that when you get saved, or the whole reason or purpose of getting saved is that God's just going to make this life a bed of roses for you. Paul said it's not that way. But he said all these afflictions, he said it's just a light affliction. Now, why did he see it as a light affliction? Why do you suppose Paul said it's a light affliction? Well, he tells. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. You see, we don't see things in light of eternity the way Apostle Paul did. The Apostle Paul knew that he had just a certain number, a few years right here when he would suffer for Christ's sake and for defense of the gospel. But then he had eternity ahead. Now look what he said. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What does that mean? When the Apostle Paul was ministering to his apostleship, he kept his eyes on the reward. He kept his eyes on the eternal things. You know, we need to do that, don't we? You know, when little things happen to us, it won't seem quite so bad if we realize it's just for a moment. One time I was having a testimony meeting. And an old black man stood up and he said, he said, my favorite verse in the Bible and it came to pass. He said, one time I was out of a job, and it came to pass. He said, one time I didn't have a place to live, and it came to pass. He said, one time my children were sick, and it came to pass. He said, nothing's forever down here. And it came to pass. No matter what kind of a trial you're going through, it'll come to pass. It's not forever. And the Apostle Paul says, all these things that I went through are just for the moment. And then I've got eternity ahead. See, now that's why he said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. 
Because no matter what happened to him, no matter what happens to me or you, it is our obligation, it is our job to see to it that the gospel remains pure or there's no hope for your children and their children's children. And the day may come when our own federal government may throw us in prison for preaching the pure gospel, but folks, we've got to do it anyway. It's the only hope that we have. Now, let me show you just how severe it is. Turn back to Galatians. Now, first, the possibility of the gospel. In other words, what makes the gospel possible. You see, we wouldn't, why do we have good news? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Well, he tells us here in verse 4. Well, let's start with verse 3 so it'll make sense. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. That's what makes the gospel possible is that Jesus gave himself for our sins. Now notice what it says here. It says that he gave himself. You see, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, but Jesus was willing to go. He gave himself for our sins. You remember when he was uh, standing before Pilate, Pilate said, don't you know that I can either take your life or release you? He said, you can't do anything to me except what's given to you of the Father. There's no way. I want to tell you something. There's no way that anybody could kill Christ. He had to lay his life down. Why? You can't kill eternal life, right? He had to willingly give himself and lay his life down so that he could take it up again. Now, folks, Jesus came to planet Earth not just to set a good example for you. And you know that's being taught in a lot of churches? Just walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Learn from Jesus. Learn how he did. Learn how he talked. Learn how he acted. Folks, listen, all of that is good. And we should pattern our life after him. But the purpose of him coming is to go to an old rugged cross and shed his blood for the sins of the world. He came as the Lamb of God to be, to be crucified for the sins of the world. Now, Paul wants you to know that. And he wants you to get that deep down in your soul that Jesus gave himself for your sins. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, now, Jesus will forgive all of your past sins, Mickey. When you're saved, he has forgiven all your past sins, but not your future sins. Well, there's all future when he died, wasn't he? Was there any past sins when he died? No, all of your sins were future. He died for what? The sins of the world. That means all of them. And that's the good news, folks died for the sins of the world. For what purpose? That he might deliver us from this present evil world. Why would he do that? Because it was the will of God our Father. Now what does it mean? Jesus died for the sins of the world that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Oh. You know what that means? That means when God saved you, he didn't intend for you to keep on living the way you did. When God saved you, he changes you. That's what it means. He saved you for the purpose of recreating you and things you once loved you now hate and things you once hate you now hate. Uh, hey, you'll now love. 
He changes you. There is no such thing as a salvation without regeneration. If you claim to get saved and live in the same old way, folks, I'm going to tell you something, you didn't get saved. You won't find anywhere in the Bible any example, any instance where anybody ever got saved that they didn't get changed. Did the Apostle Paul get changed? He sure did. Did the woman at the well get changed? She sure did. Every case, they got changed. What about about the demon act? When Jesus cast out the demons, did he get changed? Yeah, he quit living in the tombs. Roaring, screaming, and splitting his flesh with his claws. You know what he did? It says he came back clothed in his right mind, set at the feet of Jesus. Jesus died for the sins of the world that he might deliver you from this present evil world for the will of the Father. So therefore, and because of that, Paul really gets upset. Who does he get upset with? We're going to find out. You see, the apostle Paul had come through there, preached, established the church there at Galatia. He left, here come some false prophets, and Paul says they're preaching a gospel that is another gospel, which is not a gospel at all. What was they doing? They were adding lemon to the fudge. Yes, Christ saves you. But you've got to keep yourself by your works that run it. Hey, let, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Keep this in mind. The, the gospel that saves is easy. Now, if it's not easy, you ain't doing it right. Okay? See, the power is from God. The change comes from God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you get saved and you're always worrying and threatening about it, you ain't doing it right. <laughs> Why do we know that? Because Jesus says, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Now, Paul preached a gospel that saves. And I want to tell you something else about it. It saves instantaneously. I don't believe in this that you grow into salvation. I believe when God saves you, he saves you right on the spot. I mean, the thief was hanging there on the cross, and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Just that fast. I mean, and they're not being saved. Folks, they're saved. <laughs> they're not going through some kind of a, a process. They're saved immediately. The woman at the well, when she was conversing with Christ, she said, when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all these things. He said, he that speaks to you is he. She dropped her water pot, saved instantly, run into town. Said, come see a man. Told me everything. Everybody did. Isn't that amazing? I mean, she was called to ministry real quick like. <laughs> she didn't even wait to get ordained. Isn't that amazing? She's standing there talking to him, gets saved, turns into an evangelist, and run into town and started, started getting people converted. Instantaneously. The Philippian jailer saved instantaneously for time and eternity. That's the kind of gospel Paul preached. And I mean, he got bent out of shape when these false prophets came through. He said, they're preaching a gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They're trying to put lemon extract in the gospel of Christ, which will ruin it. But notice here, notice the warning, verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so now, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. That's pretty strong. You know what it means? Let him die and go to hell. That's what he means by cursed. Accursed from God. Separated from God. Why? It's too serious, folks. It's too serious. There's only one gospel and it's pure. And I want to tell you something else. There's only one gospel and there has always only been one gospel since the beginning of time. 
There's never been more than one gospel. Do you know how Abel was saved? You find out in Hebrews, it says, by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Do you know what that means? He was saved by faith, just like we are. God told Abel and Cain that he required a blood sacrifice. How do we know that? Because faith cometh by hearing, right? He had to hear that somewhere. Either uh, Adam and Eve had told the boys, God requires a blood sacrifice. Cain offered produce. Abel offered a blood sacrifice. God accepted his sacrifice because of his faith. He believed in God. What about Abraham? He believed God. And God imputed it unto him for righteousness. Everybody that was ever saved has been saved by the gospel. There's always been one gospel. And here's something else. When Jesus died for the sins of the world, he didn't die for the sins right then forward. He died for Adam's sin and Eve's sin and every man and woman that lived up till that time clear into when eternity <laughs> begins. That's the gospel. Paul said, I stand in defense of the gospel. I went through all the suffering that I've gone through because of the gospel. It would have been so easy for him to just compromise. But aren't you glad he didn't? Aren't you glad he didn't compromise? Do you realize that if Paul had compromised because of the afflictions and because of the torturings and the beatings and all of those things, that you wouldn't have a gospel date? There'd be no hope for this generation. The gospel. And each and every one of us should be set in defense for the gospel. And I'll tell you, the day's going to come. And I'll tell you this, it's going to come also right from our own denomination. The serpent's already raising his head. It's coming from, from people you'd never dream it comes from that's willing to water down the gospel, add lemon extract for the sake of unity among the brethren. I believe in unity, but not at the sake of truth. Not for, at the sake of the gospel. Paul wasn't either. He said, if an angel, you know, I'm sure Paul believed in angels, and I believe he loved angels. He said, I don't care if an angel comes and preaches anything other than what I first delivered unto you. And what was that? The death, the burial, the resurrection, or any other man. Or he goes on to say, even if I come back through here and preach another gospel, he said, let them be accursed. Now, I'll tell you something. There's just so many things that we can agree on. And I'm an agreeable sort of fella. You know, how we worship and our mode of worship, the time of worship, all of that, hey, I'm easy. <laughs> I'll compromise. But not on the gospel. Not on the gospel. Folks, there's just one way, and it's not by works. It's by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I preached this morning, he said, look unto me, all the ends of the earth and be ye saved. He's the only one. He's the Savior. Wayne, you're a good old boy, but you can't do it. Find the wrong gospel because the gospel's free. It's free. It's a free gift. Eternal life is a free gift. You can't pay for it and you can't earn it. It's a free gift. It's the death, the burial, the resurrection. And Paul's in defense of the gospel. And, and as the days come and the days approach, we need to be in defense of the gospel. I don't, care who have to, I don't care if you have to stand against your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your neighbors or the president or whoever. You've got to stand for the gospel. That's the only hope you've got. That's the only hope your children have got. That's the only hope your grandchildren have got is stand for the gospel. How can you stand for the gospel? You know how a lot of people do? You see, I want to tell you something. You don't realize this. Every one of you preachers. First of all, you didn't know this, but every one of you are preachers. And the life that you live is a sermon when you walk out that door. And the life you live either says the gospel is real, the gospel has power, or you're saying take it or leave it. <laughs> you're saying take it or leave it by your life. You see, when you come to church on Sunday and then Monday you're off out and doing worldly things, you're saying, well, the gospel really don't work. It's not that important. That's just a Sunday thing we do. See? 
People are watching your life, where you work, where you go to school. They're watching your life. Are you in defense of the gospel by the life you live? Are you true to Christ? Are you saying to a lost and dying world, try this, it works, by the life that you live? Or are you saying to the world, it really doesn't matter? Let's stay.